the connection at the very beginning as he was talking about his passions and then leaning gently on the testing and different tools. Now, I ask you to bear with me in a sense the same sort of way as, as I go through the idea of testing systems which perhaps some of you haven't come across. But how many of you have actually been involved in testing AI and learning systems? One, two, yeah. They're a bit different, aren't they, from traditional systems? And I've been working at the University of Derby now in governance of emerging and advanced technologies. And the ones that have really caught my attention of late are some of the difficulties we have with our learning systems, our AI systems. They are so different from the deterministic systems that we are used to testing. We are, and you guys, professionals of software testing, have learned over the last 40, 50 years as a profession how to look at chunks of code and work out exactly how to prove that it's correct. And to make sure that you catch any changes that are inadvertently made when people are modifying the software. You've spent years developing all of the tools that previous guy our lines are talking about, that you upgrade day by day, week by week, year by year, just like he upgraded his hi-fi system. But they, all of the work you're doing is essentially based around the concept that if I have a, this piece of code, which represents the, this piece of specification, if I put this date, test data into it, there will be one and only one correct answer. All other answers indicate there's a flaw in that software somewhere. However, testing AI software, learning software, the stuff that learns from the data you train it with, there is no one correct answer. And this is a fun something that's really, really interesting to me, is how do we then develop trust in these AI systems? How many of you live in London? So, some of you live out in Stratford, perhaps. Anybody? So, you've already come across the uh, new live face recognition systems that the police are now using there. And maybe you have sort of read in the news about the worries that people have as to whether it works effectively. Whether you will, as you walk through there, have your face matched inadvertently to someone else's face? And will you be tapped on the shoulder? And will the policeman be, oh, I'm terribly sorry, sir, madam. Um, you're obviously not the, right, the, the person I'm looking for. But the problem we have is we know that face recognition in general is not terribly Police are quoting uh, data from the NEC tests that they're, that they're using to prove. To, well, NEC, one of the biggest companies in the world in face recognition systems, they're selling face recognition to almost every police force in the world. Who knew that? Until a week ago, I didn't even know that NEC was involved in face recognition. And they're quoting phenomenally high accuracy. And yet, how many of you have nice pass modern passports with the biometric in them that you go up and you arrive into England at Heathrow or Gatwick, you put your passport on the, the scanner and you look into the camera and if you're very lucky first time, it'll say, okay, and it'll open the door. But if otherwise, it says, try again. You do it again. Try again. And some people are unlucky enough that they, it eventually gives up and says, go over there to see the person, the real life human. 
Or sometimes, for me, typically at Heathrow or Gatwick, it's third time lucky. Now, the thing that's interesting, and this is not, I don't think this is an AI system at all, a learning system, it just takes the measurements from the camera, nice high resolution camera, and checks it on a one to one basis with the met biometric that's on the passport. And for me, Heathrow and Gatwick get it right 33% of the time, which is interesting. If they're using that same technology to match my face to their database and find that I'm not in the database, that's all right. But it finds a match, it's probably not a binary choice, yes, no. It's probably a probabilistic answer. So I want to be later on in the session when I've explored a few of these things. Use some questions that come from the, big, the many, many Bs of big data. And I'll talk about those in the last section. So how do we, basically, how do we take the lessons we have learned from our traditional deterministic systems testing with test harnesses, test data, maybe using canned live data, et cetera, et cetera, all those lovely things we do. Are there any lessons from that, or do we have to change everything as we move into the world of learning systems, AI, machine learning? I want to cover these three sections. I'll go into a little bit more detail about the AI and machine learning differences from traditional systems, and then look at some of the consequences which are really important to us and to society. And then look at a few questions we can ask ourselves so that we can perhaps get a better handle on how we can make those systems more trustworthy. How we humans can use them effectively to make life better for ourselves, for our organizations, and for society in general. Because we're beginning to find we need to think about using IT to make the world better. Not just to make things more efficient and cheaper, but to make it better. But before I start on this, I want to have a look at this little chart, which I've been constructing from data created by the Standish Group over in the States since 1994, looking at how good we are as an industry at producing systems, and projects that actually are on time to budget and originally met the functionality requirements as contracted for. And then in about 2013, 14, they changed to the third parameter was delivering value to the organization. The red and the orange lines are the failures. Those uh, projects, those IT projects, which never actually worked properly, in spite of all the efforts of you guys, the software testing people. The blue and the purple line, the middle line, those are those projects that the IT directors, the CIOs, who provide the data to Standard Group on a biannual basis, judge to be on time to budget and either met the functionality contract or purple one, the extra one, delivering business value. You see, back in the day, IT directors got a bit fed up with this lousy performance. Uh, 29, 35, 32, 37, 39% of projects were successful. And they said, well, you know, in this era where everything's changing so fast, we can't really be expected to deliver the contracted for functionality because things have changed. So, yeah, we spend an awful lot of time managing change through these long-term projects. But we, like, we do our bit, IT bit projects to deliver business value. So Standard Group said, okay, right, you do that, guys. And we'll carry on tracking. And they backtracked to 2011 to give a comparison. And the world was kind of rather shocked 
changing to delivering value from meeting the contracted for functionality dropped the success rate of projects by 8, 10 percent, 12 percent in 2012. So we have a problem overall with our traditional systems. This was not up till around about 2016 or so, I don't think there would have been many AI type related projects in there. So we have at the foundation of this that as an industry we are quite remarkably unsuccessful in delivering business value on time and to budget, in spite of all your best efforts as software test engineers. This is interesting. Where life gets really interesting in the world of analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning, AI, is this chart from John Easton from IBM. He put this together around about 2012. And he showed it at a SAS conference about 2013, 2014. And this is the problem we have of data veracity. And he was saying, and there's no evidence for us to believe other than that, that he was correct then and he's still correct, that 80% of the data that we have around us from all sources, including inside our own corporate master databases at ERP systems, 80% of the data we are uncertain as to whether those data are correct or incorrect. Not that they're all wrong, but we just cannot easily determine which correct and incorrect. And if any of you who have been involved in big ERP implementations, you will have no, come across the fact that you clean up the data in your master databases and throw away typically 70 or so percent of all the old data, because it's all out of date, wrong, etc. And you recreate it from the new data when you go into your new spanking, uh, uh, new system. What's interesting is that within five years, roughly, those beautifully clean master databases in Oracle or, or SAP or wherever are now contaminated in ways you can't detect very easily. And AI and all these advanced analytics are using the corporate data or they're using social media data and they're trying to make sense of it and to learn the decision patterns. And it will find patterns. You give it a million rows of 100 columns wide data, and any of these machine learning, AI, predictive analytics packages will find patterns. They'll do regression analysis, they'll do whatever, and they will find patterns, most of which have no causality at all. They're just patterns in the data. Now, some of the patterns maybe are and actually will be real very misleading at times. So how do we cope with the fact that we just throw large chunks of data to train our systems? We don't have any formal UML specification of how this thing will work. But we do of the actual code that learns is a code that says this is how you learn. And you can test it. But what you can't do is once you then throw the real world at it and say, learn from that, you don't have any UML. You don't have any real test cases. You have just learnt, trained it, taught it to find the patterns that you want it to, you hope, replicate the good thing. You're great at this. This is your your day-to-day -day job, isn't it, folks? This is what you do. You look at the specifications, you break it down into little bits that you can then test one by one with your test harness, your test scripts, and all of this data. And you can automate it so that as someone modifies a little part of the software, you can rerun the entire heart test script for the whole system to prove they've only changed the bit they were supposed to change it and that it's working. But, come to a learning system. It's not going to do that. The 
behavior of these AI, machine learning, predictive analytics based systems. They operate on what they have learned. Many of them we don't even understand how they have found those patterns. If you're using machine learning neural network type of face recognition system, stashed inside the software are matrix after matrix after matrix, which are the equivalent of individual neural network nodes. And for a face recognition system, you may well have half a million to a million um, elements within those, ve uh, those matrices. The weightings on all sorts of stuff. behavior is only dependent on the training you've given them. And they will learn all the biases in the data that's there and the biases in the training process. <coughs> Unlike our traditional systems, which I grew up on many, many, many years ago, which were deterministic, these are probabilistic systems. And they don't say that is or is not a face that I recognize. They'll say, well, it's 85% probable that it's Richard Sell's face, and it's 5% probable that it's somebody else's, and 5% I can't find. Did anybody notice a year or so back when Amazon came clean about the AI they had trained to help them with their HR problem they had? They had lots and lots of people applying for jobs of a particular role. From the context, it's probably some sort of software uh, creating type of role. And they got thousands of applications. And so they decided they'd get an AI and train it up on the last 10,000 job applicants or applications they had had and trained it to look at the pattern and say, here's the patterns in the data, uh, job description, uh, job application, competencies, personal statements, and so on. Because what they were wanting was to use AI to quickly filter those applications. And then, in January 2018, no, sorry, 2019, they discovered a little problem. They discovered that it was entirely sexist. It would only put forward male applicants for a job because it had learned the data bias in those 10,000 job applications that Amazon never recruited for that particular role, females. They then decided that they would try and fiddle with the algorithms, they thought. But that, of course, betrays a gross lack of understanding of how AI systems work. They do not have algorithms to do anything other than to find patterns that, have been, that are found in the data. They could have easily removed, cleansed the data somewhat to remove the male-female indicator. They could have removed the, the names to hide the gender of the applicant. But what they could not do would be to clean up the job, um, the personal statement. Because the personal statement, we know, and HR uh, people tell me time and time again, on average, the personal statement is written differently by males and females, and the AI would have found that same pattern. Or IBM Watson, they created that uh, Watson's cognitive system that won at Jeopardy back in 2012 or thereabouts. Curious um, TV contest, but it won. It was brilliant. And they said, how can we do good with it? They will create Watson Oncology. They wanted to create a system that would help everybody, every cancer specialist in the world to be able to be as good as the best in the world using Watson that ingest 
Three quarters of a million academic and research papers about diagnosis and treatment of, um, of cancer and make it available to the world. And they use the experts at the Sloan Memorial Kettering Hospital, who were the world experts. And then they discovered something rather horrifying. It only worked in the hospital where it was created. Because no other hospital in the world had the same capabilities, protocols, and all of the test facilities and so on. And that training bias meant it wasn't going to work anywhere else. We know it's reported so regularly that you have to get your data cleaned up. Here are two examples where people didn't think, didn't work, weren't aware of the biases in their data. The top one, they were trying to teach an AI system to understand the difference between friendly and enemy tanks. They did all the usual things, they got all the photos, took 80% for training, ran it through and again and again and again until it was working well. Took the other 20% as a test case a bit later on. Standard AI data science test, testing for learning systems, 80% to train, 20% it was accidental that they discovered what it had actually learned. It didn't even know there were any tanks in the photos. It only knew the background. It only knew that there were forests and deserts. There are other ones training the system to recognize a different husky dog and a wolf. Only it learned about the green grass and the snow between, in the background. Or a judgment when it's problem. Most Western-based face recognition systems, which are trained on a standard hundred thousand photos, cannot see black women's faces at all. It doesn't, it's not that it can't detect, uh, can't um, recognise them in terms of matching to a database. It can't even find that face in the background in the photo because only 1.5% of the photos in the training database are of dark black women. 75% are Caucasian males. And it turns out that in China, the problem is the other way around. Very, very good at recognizing Chinese faces and so on, and lousy at white and black faces. So how many of you have heard of the 12 Vs of big data? Or even the three Vs of big data from 2001? Originally, the first three, volume, velocity, and variety, were the definitional uh, statement of this defines big data. Because it's too big, too fast, too varied for us to be able to cope with current technology. Well, that no longer applies. There's only a very few sources of data which are too big or too fast for us to cope with. You can go to IBM and buy a, 60, a 64 petabyte solid state memory about this high, standard rack size, for about uh, $16 million. And you can get as many of those as you like. So volume's not a problem, particularly. Then some of my students about five years ago came up with the next set of Vs. Variability, value, veracity, validity, volatility, verbosity, vulnerability, verification, visualization. And there's a set of these which aren't defining big data, but are posing really interesting questions about the data in relation to what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> so I want to give you a few little insights into some of the questions as you look at AI and machine learning systems, and even predictive analytics systems, that will help you to begin to ask the right questions about how you actually should test these things. Because ultimately, we need to be able to trust these systems. Now, one of the other problems with human beings is we actually 
trust our IT rather too much. That's what called a credit crunch. How many of you know the term GIGO? And it means? Go in, go reserve. It used to mean that, but I came across a rather interesting variation just recently, which kind of illustrates how too many people have implicit trust in our systems of any sort. Garbage in, gospel out. Keep that at the back of your mind because those actually working in AI and machine learning actually understand just how kind of variable it is. But it isn't trusted in the same way as we used to be able to trust our deterministic systems, as long as the data is correct. Let's start off with variety. Now, those, that tank problem, the variety problem was they hadn't got tanks in a whole range of different backgrounds. All of the enemy tanks in one background, all of the um, friendly tanks against another background. They should have had lots of different backgrounds for all of the pictures. One of my students is having a think about how we could perhaps handle the problem with that 100,000 photo training database for face recognition. Why don't we set up a little sort of kind of a loop that takes all of those 100,000 photos and then scales somehow the skin color and tones across from white to dark black. So instead of having one and a half percent of dark black faces, we have 100, well, we have say 10% and 10% white, 10% middle color. Maybe that would be a better thing. But one of the things we know from statistics and regression analysis is if you don't have an even spread of your data, you end up with problems. Even if you take the bell curve, those things at the far ends turn out very infrequently, which represent the real world. But it doesn't necessarily allow the statistical functions to really understand how to detect those different areas. You need to be thinking it about it as you design your systems. There's a well-known problem in courts where they're trying to assess those the people who are brought up before the courts for bail. It turns out that the person who designed the uh, questionnaire, both at the one that was used up in the northeast of England and a similar one in Chicago, clearly was a middle-class white academic who only understood how the demographics of his or her sort of environment lived and didn't understand the fundamental differences of other ethnic groups. It turns out that the questions end up being effectively all asking one question. Are you black or are you white? If you are white, you can have bail. If you are black, you can't have bail. Because they were, that questionnaire was designed, I won't say carelessly, but without adequate understanding of the differences in society. You have to be looking at variety of data, variety of all sorts of things as you do your testing. One of the other things that's becoming very, very apparent about all of this use of human data in AI, we need to have much, much more diverse teams. In one sense, in your profession with deterministic system, systems, all you need are people who can, say, to trivialize it slightly, read the UML specification, understand what data needs to go in the front to test it to give this deterministic answer, the one and only answer. There's a lot of other skills involved, obviously, but that's the fundamental. It doesn't matter who they are, as long as they have the right skills. Team composition when you're playing or involved with AI in almost any aspect is going to need a different sort of approach to building your team. Your teams need to be gender, 
ethnicity, disability, social demographics varied. Otherwise, you won't understand some of these very important differences. It was only when Joy Bulamweni tried to get her AI to see her as she walked into her office and say, hello, Joy, and she discovered have an interesting situation with each of, um, the passport office. We now have, apparently, an online application system. You don't have to take your photo and everything down to the post office to get it sorted out. You can go online. And in 2016, apparently, when they implemented it, they already knew they had a problem, an ethnicity problem. Because we know that black Africans tend to have fuller lips than Caucasians. And we know from the instructions you mustn't be smiling when you, with, in your photo you take your passport. And yet the algorithm that's checking is that a smiley face picks up on black Africans with a fuller lips and says, you're smiling, that photo is not acceptable. Now they knew that in 2016 when they went live and left it in, and it is still unchanged. How did that happen? Was it a political decision, or was it a testing decision, or was it a, oh, it's all too hard? Veracity, truth, and trust. I've talked about data bias. I've talked about the fact that it's probabilistic. We can't get it to say it is definitely A or not A. It's probably 80-90% of the right face. Another thing that's rather interesting is it turns out that data scientists love to get their models fitting better and better and better. There's a study from Booking.com which suggests there's an optimal level of model fit and be able to predict what you want. Because if it gets too good at guessing the things that you haven't told it, and saying, oh, by the way, I think you probably want to go here, and you, hang on, I've not told you about this, I do want to go there, it kind of causes problems. On the right-hand side is what's happening in some companies who are, trying to get, who are getting into this, and they're, and they're using AI and machine learning quite heavily. One of the things they're learning to do is not at the testing level, but at the actual operational level. The CDO, the chief marketing officer, or whoever is actually using that to drive the business. And some organizations are assessing the results of their AI on an hourly, or a daily, or a weekly basis to decide whether to kill that AI and stop using it. So we have to be looking very carefully at how we trust them. And you guys do actually have a role to play in that, I think, as well. Two books, which I think will be very, very important. The Hello World by Hannah Fry is very interesting in the way that she looks at a whole, an enormous range of situations where AI has been developed, machine learning has been developed, and all sorts of very difficult problems have happened. She also identifies some potential solutions or some actual solutions where people are able to get past the problems. Invisible Women by um, Caroline Piada Perez, however, is of a different order. It's written around looking at the raw data we have. She gives case after case where in this specific instance, the data hides the differences between males and females in ways which are very, very bad, particularly for females. For example, we know, don't we, all of us, that the sign of a heart attack is a pain in the left arm and in back here. Yet 50% of the world presents with different symptoms. It just so happens that 50% of the world who are presenting with atypical symptoms are all female. So actually, there are two sets of symptoms. There's one set for males, one set for females. 
but we do not have that data. We do not have any data, or virtually no data, about how women respond to almost any drugs. Because the pharma pharmaceutical companies do not wish to have their uh, drug test upset by the monthly cycle. So they choose males most of the time. The average five foot eight, five foot nine, 80 kilo bloke. It turns out, according to uh, individual women, that women respond to heart, blood pressure, um, <coughs> or blood pressure tablets differently. And, and, and so it goes. Now, very interesting to read it purely about the fact we don't categorize males and female data separately, which makes it very difficult to use AI and machine learning effectively. But when we take that lesson across other categories, ethnicity, um, and also social mobility, social um, situations, to understand that the way that I, in my life, white middle class, sort of nearing retirement perhaps, my type of lifestyle, it may be very, very different in many respects to all sorts of other ones. Whether you use social class A, B, C, D, and so on, or whatever. We need to be thinking extremely carefully about all of the data that we're use, using to, sit, to try and understand where it lacks the critical classification that will allow that AI to actually do something useful and valuable. Seems to run out of time, folks. That's where I wanted to get to. Thank you very much. Any questions?